much and it's wonderful to be here amongst friends and I'm actually delighted to be amongst this very distinguished group of leaders here to be discussing development because this group as you can see is uh, three very unique competencies. So in this cohort, we have first generation entrepreneurs. We have entrepreneurs who have the responsibility of furthering their family's legacy and expanding the capital base to deliver great returns. And we have business leaders who don't only have responsibility of corporate business expansion, but like my friend Khalid, also have the government looking at them to say, expand their interests. So I am going to be looking forward to this group, which between them has 165 years of business experience across these three domains and multiple geographies. And I'm quite excited to learning and understanding their perspectives. <clears throat> so first I want to go to Nathan. Nathan, with the development of Lavasa, you created a development template for India, which India had not seen till that point in time. And now Nathan leads expansion for the DS group and he is aiming for a thousand crore top line over the next five years. So over these decades, Nathan, you've structured multiple partnerships for growth and across a spectrum of uh, uh, stakeholders. So when you have done this, what would be your key learnings in selecting a partner and did you have a framework over all these years on which you assess if a partnership is going to be value accretive to all the stakeholders? Yeah, thanks, thank you. So uh, many years ago, a friend of mine who was going through an emotional breakup uh, said rather cynically, if you can't be with the one you love, be with the one who loves you. Uh, that's kind of the philosophy that uh, I think we have followed through even, and uh, even at Lavasa, why we didn't articulate it quite that way. Uh, our chairman was very clear that partner with those who want to partner with you, right? So we don't, and I believe even now at DS, we look for partners firstly who want to collaborate with us. Uh, you can go and you pitch obviously because you don't know everyone to start with, but there has to be a genuine mutual desire to collaborate. A reluctant partner from day one is not a recipe for success. Uh, secondly, you look at what each partner brings. So in any relationship, uh, each partner needs to bring something that the other partner doesn't have, right? So in Lavasa, we had land, we had uh, execution abilities. We looked to the hotel partner or hospital partner, whatever, to bring the uh, expertise to run the project, right? Uh, and uh, we would stay out of operations because we knew we were not good at that. Uh, we're following a similar template at DS as well. So we know what we bring to the table and we are blessed to have good partners who bring their expertise, their marketing, their reach to the table to make the partnership successful. And that goes not just with operators, but it also goes with your financial partners. It goes with your project partners as well. So each one needs to bring something that the other person values and that goes you know, for the long term of the relationship. The thirdly, you also need to be very clear of the realistic expectations because life doesn't always go to plan as low as, as a case in point, but no one sh at the end of the day sh should be able to come and say that uh, you misled me or you misrepresented. Life goes south, that's part of the risk that we all take, but we all go into it with eyes open. Wonderful. <clears throat> so my learning is like in any relationship, there has to be pragmatism. But the basis of pragmatism that Nathan laid out was to say, the relationship is one of complementarity. Both parties bring to the table uh, strengths, benefits which are unique 
and it's a relationship, you know, which is of mutual love and respect. Thank you for that, Nathan. Then similarly, on the far end of the table <coughs> is a gentleman about whom I have to tell you. You know, I've worked many years at the Taj and uh, amongst Taj's very first partnerships, which was done in the early 70s, was by, the, by Pramod Ranjan's uh, grandfather. And Pramod, though he did not study architecture and design, he's a gifted landscape designer. And you will see his work reflected in the global awards that the, you know, that Taj Madhikari is won at Kurg or you see Andamans. And I was joking with him to say he decides to go on to places where no man has gone before. You know, it's like Star Trek. You know, these have to be places which are virgin, which are inaccessible. And uh, if you actually gave him a very structured footprint, uh, he may not do a great job. But if you gave him a very difficult virgin plot of land that nobody has an idea about, he does that. And it's also reflected in his own portfolio of seven hotels. Besides this, Pramod's very interested in wellness and he's looking at you know, uh, getting a great brand in there. He's developing leisure resorts in Australia. And in addition, he's working with the government in Peru to develop two Inca islands. Now, given this very wide diversity of interest, promote and the fact that you worked with governments, obviously corporates, local communities, what would be your key learnings in ensuring partnerships that are sustainable? And actually, how do you go about selecting a partner? Do you have a filter through which you say, hey, this partnership makes sense? Thank you. <clears throat> so, I, th I think the most important thing is um, you need to have aligned, uh, an aligned vision, your partner and you, and different projects require different visions and competencies. So someone in South, <clears throat> South America and Peru might not be you know, well suited with my current partners, so I've got to look at the source markets, I've got to make sure that um, they're strong in that area, um, and also have the appetite for doing something that's very different because their reputation is also at stake to make sure that the venture does succeed. So yeah, I think a, a very detailed study of different partners is necessary before you enter into a partnership. Um, <clears throat> I've, there's a legacy relationship with the Taj which my grandfather built and obviously in within India that's the default partner that I would go to. And uh, I, I am the current caretaker for my grandfather's uh, properties that he built. But I also do these um, very difficult and, and off the beaten track properties uh, in my own capacity outside Oriental hotels. So I don't jeopardize the, the company uh, which my grandfather built. Uh, <clears throat> of course, even these properties in India, the, like the Coog property that you mentioned and also the, uh, the Andaman property, those are done in a separate SPV outside uh, simply because it was, uh, you know, a very different beast to what we already had in the uh, portfolio. Uh, so, I th yeah, so that's basically what it is. You really need to... F figure out what the strengths are of each of your partners in the markets that you're in and, and align yourself with them. Yeah. Thank you, Pramod. I really liked when you said, when you used two words. The first was caretaker, you know, which not only shows one's fiduciary responsibility, but also the ethos to promote protect and then nourish the heritage that you've been gifted with. And second, you said one has to enjoy the partnership. 
and what may work in one geography may not work in the other. So understanding that brings in alignment. Thank you. Uh, these are not only lessons for others, I am actually reiterating these and saving to my brain. Thank you for that. Now on my immediate right is a very accomplished lady uh, and she is by default both right and left brained because uh, she has a very strong sense of financial quantification. So Sonika has established two very unique assets in two very unique markets which is Noida and Ludhiana. And she has also created a joint venture with Berger to create a thousand key portfolio over the next five years. Now what I wanted to ask you Sonika is, when opportunities come to you, do you have a framework to qualify those opportunities? What sort of quantification do you use for growth? And how would you measure success? And using this metrics, how do you select a partner for a potential partnership? Um, yeah, hi Rahul and uh, thank you very much for, uh, you know, your motivational comments. It means a lot. And um, I hope what I speak can actually do uh, justice to what you just said. Um, yeah, um, so for partnerships, um, I think, um, uh, be it the education industry or the hotels or the real estate at large that we are functioning on, I think uh, with this extremely competitive world and the fact that, you know, um, it's a cutthroat competition out there, I think those days are gone that you wanted to be let's say, a jack of all and master of none, and maybe look at the concept of completely backward and forward integrated to have a complete control <clears throat> on the entire supply chain so that you're de-risking yourself. I think first and foremost is rather than looking outside, we look internally and do our own SWOT. It's extremely important what my weaknesses are. And once I've really understood what our weaknesses are, we then further establish of kind of the strategic alliances or partnerships that we want to intend to get into. Now those partnerships could be as big as, let's say, brand alliances. It could be as good as financial partnerships, or it could be as small as probably partnerships. It could be in the F&B space, for instance. Now when we are looking at, uh, you know, partnerships, um, I know my key strengths and key weaknesses, and I can tell you for a case in point, let's say our, our joint venture with Steigenberger. We knew our strength was there, that we understood the Indian region very well. The name of MBD was quite a household name, whichever place, whichever city you wanted to go to. And in these last 20 years, we had exhibited a great performance in our primary as well as our secondary comp set financial as well as guest experiences. But we also knew that we are, our business is incumbent on international business coming into our hotels. Which means, does my distribution that I currently hold suffice for my growth? The answer was no. Then we started looking around. And we found a partner which was quite new to enter India and yet they had a very strong global distribution network and marketing in place. And then the things start, you know, kind of falling in place. Um, so I think more than looking outside, we look inside first and then start looking at partnerships, which we can deliver on and others can deliver on. And as you said, right, right brain and left brain. Well, for me, everything starts with, of course, financials. But I can tell you for a fact and relationships, once you've entered into it could be a good building block, the financials, but at the end of the day, it's all about relationships and everything then falls in place. You don't look at contracts, you don't look at anything, but your relationship with your partners is the end game, which makes you survive in that particular relationships. You look at the contracts and the numbers only when you're not doing well. <laughs> it's as simple as that. So that's what it is and that's been the building ground for us to proceed with partnerships and it's worked decently well for us. Thank you, wonderful. So very unique perspective. 
that the first starting point is looking within to do a sort of one's own abilities and to accept what one's is deficient in and then look for a partner who supports that. And even though, you know, she is known for quantification, uh, I really like her approach to say that while numbers may stand, it is relationships that steady. Thank you, Sonika. Now, I have a very unique gentleman <coughs> sitting in bang in the middle of the panel because <laughs> while all of us, you know, create assets, sell assets, market assets, Khalid's responsibility is actually creating a destination and marketing that destination. You know, the Al Marjan Islands, it's a unique feat. Four and a half kilometers deep into the sea, a man-made island. It's the creation of a destination. And the responsibility on Khalid is to say, hey, how do you create a great ecosystem in that destination? What partnerships does one get? So Khalid, if you could spend a minute taking us through, you know, what's this entire ecosystem all about? And what partnerships are you seeking for Marjan? Well, uh, thanks Rahul for the uh, introduction. So, um, what we do in Russell Khaima is we actually enable the market for the investors to come and join us with our success story. So, Marjan is the master developer of the government of Russell Khaima. What we do is we invest in creating and developing the infrastructure to create waterfront destinations, uh, urban development or mountain development, etc. Our main focal point is creating these destinations and sell the plots by partnering with investors, developers, uh, listed companies, financial institutes that can actually take the opportunity of developing the real estate project and operate it or sell it to third party investors in the real estate market. Al Marjan Island is actually our flagship. We have fully sold it out. We have partnership with majority of the international hoteliers. We have actually uh, targeting 12,000 hotel keys. 15,000 residential units, around 650 holiday homes and villas. And actually, this is one of the main uh, developments that we have created, and we have brought the attraction by having the very famous uh, Wynn Resort, integrated resort. And that is how we have started to create the relationship with our investors. So we are actually enabling the market. We are not intending to go into the competition. So we are just bringing an opportunity for everyone to join us. So we are currently having a 1.1 million uh, uh, visitors at the moment. We are expected to be 5.5 in the coming few years. So this is five times of what we have currently. And we are only on a 7,000 hotel keys. So you can understand the opportunity for everyone to join us. And that's why we, we, we are actually, we want to invite everyone to be part of this success story. Fantastic, Khalid. <clears throat> so people earlier use water to grow food. Now, Khalid Al Marjan is using water to grow GDP. You know, so from a million visitors, 1.1 1 .1 million visitors to 5.5 million visitors on a four and a half kilometer stretch reclaimed and people who participate in their land is freehold? Yeah, so uh, all the uh, developments or the, the, the master plans that we create is freehold, 100% ownership. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Now, next to Khalid, I have to confess, <clears throat> is a gentleman I have spoken earlier but met only today. And when I met SP, I told him his photographs don't do justice to him. You know, it's like my friend Sri Ratan Keswani. 
if you see him in the photographs, you would think he is much older, but I think this adds to his uh, appeal. And similarly for SP, you know, in the photographs, you know, he… I, I could tell you what I told him, you know. I said, hey, in the photographs, it made you look at least a decade older and I'm surprised to see somebody who's so youthful and so young. And what's very interesting about SP is that he's not a hotelier by training. He spent 22 years in the US, he was a techie and he's created and seeded technology businesses and those businesses he exited for a couple of hundreds of millions of dollars and he also went into real estate and life sciences. And then he said, let me also have a stable EBITDA NVT portfolio and that's how we happened to come into hospitality. So 20 years in the US and the last 17 years, he's been uh, here in India and has grown a very interesting hotel portfolio. So SP, I have to ask you this. You know, you have created businesses, you have sold businesses, you have done life sciences, real estate, tech and hotels. When you look across all these asset classes, what are your learnings creating successful partnerships? And if you could just enumerate probably the top three thoughts. Well, uh, <clears throat> thanks for your compliments. Uh, when you rushed and met me, I thought you'll say, sir, you look like Motiji, <laughs> but you know, but you didn't say that. Um, yes, I am young, okay. Uh, I am very good at sports, uh, both outdoor and indoor. There's one indoor game I'm very good at. Uh, guess what that is? Okay, I can beat you in 15 points. So, uh, I'm good at sports, so I'm, thanks for the compliments. I will change my photograph, okay? <laughs> But yeah, I have lived across uh, US, um, multiple verticals, uh, life sciences, healthcare. I'm a strategic investor in a couple of uh, three startup companies out of Palo Alto. One is in the loyalty space in the hospitality industry. It's now valued at more than uh, $200 million. Uh, what's important in, in partnerships in all of these deals is uh, most of the deals, I am the sole entrepreneur, I am the sole guy. I generally don't take partners unless I need one uh, for the strategic reasons. Um, hospitality is the toughest business. If anybody is thinking that it's the easy business, so don't venture into it just because your dad has a lot of money and you have a piece of land and you just want to build one hotel. It's a tough business. I strongly feel that one should not, as an entrepreneur, should not cha chase what is hot in the market today. Actually, you have to wait and see when the downturn happens, when you can enter into it. So it's like, you know, missionary versus mercenaries. You know, missionary is somebody who you would like, who creates value for the product in the long term. Eventually, that missionary, uh, that missionary gets more money than the mercenaries. A mercenary is somebody who's just chasing the money, who creates the product just for the money and then sells off. So in all my partnerships and exits, I played a key role in terms of the operations. My expertise are in value engineering, business process reengineering, supply chain. Uh, in any industry you, you give me, I would be able to tell the backwards and forward integration, how it needs to be done. And as, as uh, I said there are several things in the partnership is, you know, I s certainly feel there has to be a math element to it. There has to be physics and chemistry. These are some of the things that I constantly use. And I'll elaborate that when you talk about the strategic partnership in my next question, if, if I'm given a chance. But what is important is in strategic partnerships also uh, is to an align your goals, okay? So make sure your uh, goals are aligned. If, if you have a different vision and somebody else has a different vision in your team, then your goals don't align. Uh, again, it's all about people. Uh, the people that you uh, uh, put together, 
to execute uh, the work, uh, especially when it comes to the hotel industry, it's all about people-centric. You can create the greatest product uh, in town, but if you don't have the service levels to meet the standards and the customer expectation, uh, you, will, you, will, you will die. And that's what is very important, and that's why everybody is now scaling up in customer service uh, and trying to, uh, trying to attend the customer needs on a, on a basis. So in, in any of these deals, what is important is to ensure that you understand the business, okay? So don't put your money in, in a business that you don't understand. And if you put money in a business that you don't understand, you better have somebody who advises and tells you, yeah, this is a good business and these, these are the positives and negatives. So uh, do a SWOT analysis of, of, of any investments that you make. Thank you. Thank you, SP. <coughs> I see we have under four minutes. So I'll rush a little. And I was reflecting, Sonika, on what you said earlier that while numbers are critical, it is relationships, you know, which is the sway, the people that you work with. I actually wanted to segue Nathan into that, that, you know, even when we do deals or any partnerships, we are actually doing a handshake with an individual or a set of individuals. But those individuals may not remain with the institution. So what do you do? How do you de-risk a partnership? if those individuals are not there. Your quick take on that, Nathan. So you need, of course, a good uh, sound agreement, which both of you have agreed on. And I always say that agreement must survive. A bus can hit me tomorrow. The agreement needs to carry on. So I mean, we have, I have many of my partners in the room. Uh, <laughs> life goes on. We move around. People grow. People shift. Uh, but the agreements continue. So if they're well-founded, uh, and you have a legal document, hopefully you never have to open that drawer, but if your successor has to, it should be clean and clear so that there's no misunderstandings. Thank you. Pramod, if I may take the liberty of asking a personal question. You know, you lived through a big grief and a loss uh, last year. You lost your uh, wife to cancer last year. So somebody who's in the midst of all this action, multiple geographies, multiple things consuming your bandwidth, and engage with multiple partners, how does somebody maintain equanimity and gather the energy, you know, to focus on business and driving partnerships? God. Um. <clears throat> I think everybody reacts differently, people are different. So I was fortunate enough to be able to dive into work and for me work is more into you know, the wilderness, into nature and I think it's a great um, you know, way of healing yourself. You know, you heard of forest bathing, the Japanese term. So I think I was fortunate enough to expose myself to all that. And of course, um, I guess I needed to keep myself mentally and physically occupied. So I got into a lot of projects. I'm regretting now, but it was great then. Um, again, in Lakshadweep, which is a very difficult place to build, and a few other challenging spots. So yeah, I think you, you just have to pick up and motivate yourself and move on. Yeah. Thank you. So, while Krishna said, Karmanya Vadi ka raste, you've given it a different interpretation. Thank you for that. Because work is not only for outcomes, but to embed oneself in work for healing. It's very unique. And I'll take Bhuvnesh's permission to just take two more minutes, very quickly, Khalid, when you look at potential investors coming into Marjan, what sort of uh, IRRs should investors typically look at and uh, what are the kind of development costs, especially if I compare to the closest neighbor Dubai, how would it stack up? 
Russell Khaimah is always attractive in terms of IRRs, uh, especially when we're talking about the hospitality. We're talking about an average of 16% IRRs. And on the residential, I would say 35 to 50% easy. And I can, I can say that many investors have actually uh, made more than this in terms of uh, returns by trying to manage definitely their costs and their timelines, etc. Um, when we are talking about the investment as, as, um, as, as the cost, um, we are cheaper than other Emirates uh, by at least we're talking about 10 to 15 percent and there is a reason behind this. First of all, we have a lower uh, labor cost. Accommodation, cost of accommodation is cheaper. And the most important element, most of the materials. You know, Ras al-Khaimah is always known for the industrial uh, uh, city. So, uh, so most of the materials is manufactured in Ras al-Khaimah, from the mountains, from having rock ceramics, from having all the elements that associated with the construction, con uh, concrete and sector. So, um, so that is the reason that you can achieve at least 10 to 15 percent uh, lower construction cost, yes. Thank you. So 18% IRR and construction cost 15% lower. And it's very interesting. Russell Kema also has zero income tax. And I think corporate tax, depending on the industry and business, is like zero to 9%. Uh, Sonika, quickly I wanted to ask you, besides your own business and the group, outside of the group, is there any partnerships you've looked at and you said, hey, this is a good benchmark for how to do a sustainable deal? I think uh, uh, more than looking at external partnerships because everybody's circumstances, nuances and on-ground realities are not the same as you probably see it in public domain. But I think we've looked internally a lot and, um, you know, worked on um, analyzing what's worked for us for our, you know, internal partnerships. I mean, for these 20, 22 years, we've had a great partnership with the Radisson Group. Mm. And, you know, I look back again and again to really understand what's worked best for us. And um, I think what's beautiful, what has been beautiful, has been that, you know, I think both the groups have understood our key strengths and our key weaknesses, and we've trusted each other's decision making in that. They have trusted us on the operations and we've excelled in that. And we've trusted them in terms of giving us support on the external marketing, um, international uh, uh, you know, uh, distribution system. And that's been our building blocks to even emulate as when we looked at our partnership for the Steigenberger Group. So I think we look internally a lot more than external because it's very difficult to understand the exact nuances from a, you know, like a, from a secondary public domain information, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our time is up. But with that, we, you know, what Sonika said in the end, I think it sums it up beautifully, that the bedrock of a successful partnership is great trust. If you have trust in the partnership, if you have trust in the relationship, you know, things may go up and down a little, but trust really makes it sustainable. Thank you very much. Raul, Thank can you. I, can I just make a comment on strategic partnership? It's like, you know, your marriage. Uh, I always tell my strategic partner that I don't want to sleep with him every day, okay? Because strategic partnerships are very important when it comes to uh, investments where they can add value to your business. But if he is asking you to kind of, you know, uh, toe the line uh, is when you can't make those partnerships stronger. Uh, in any of the strategic partnerships, as I said, the math, physics, chemistry has to align. Uh, and that is very important for each one of us to understand when you're acquiring a business or making a partnership, if these three elements uh, aligned uh, with your uh, 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 thinking, then that's when I think you should make strong partnerships. Thank you. So that's a gem of a framework to use because when we were in school, PCM meant physics, chemistry and maths. 
and SP has used the same framework to say to assess a partnership, look at the chemistry, look at the physics and obviously do the maths very well. Thank you very much. It's been brilliant to dialogue with the panel and have your attention. Much appreciate. Thank you.